Hey everyone, welcome to week 9 of Computer Science 225. This week we're talking about how to search. We'll first look at how do you search for the contents of files, like how do you search for a file that contains a certain phrase or that contains a certain thing. This is often really helpful in coding because if you have a bunch of program source code files and you want to find all of the files that have a certain method in it perhaps or all of the files that uh, call a certain function or contain a certain variable. You can search in files to do that. We'll look at how to do that with the grep command. Then we'll look at how to search for files not by their contents but by their like metadata essentially. So the name of the file is probably the most frequent one. We can also look for files that have been modified a certain amount of time ago or files that are executable or specifically directories or files and things like that. Then we'll talk about how to compare files. So oftentimes we'll uh, have two files that are sort of maybe similar and we want to compare them to see what the differences between them are. We actually already saw this a little bit when we talked about Git. Git also lets us compare multiple files essentially, but one is sort of like the old file and one is the new file. Today we'll look at how to do that just in general. Between any two files you might have, how do you compare them and see the differences between them? And then finally, today we'll talk about how to do search and replace across multiple files. We saw how to do this just in one file using vim with the like colon percent s substitute commands. But today we'll look at a program called sed that allows us to search and replace in a whole bunch of files all at once. So let me pull up a terminal and then we can get started talking about grep. Okay, so let me cd into a directory that has a bunch of .java files in it. This is sort of like a simple command line Java game that I used to give for an assignment. And so let's uh, try out the grep command. So the way that grep works is we sort of start with the command grep and then we have the thing that we want to search for. And so in this example, let's say we want to search for this method called set foreground, which is for setting the foreground color of the terminal. So grep first takes the thing that you want to search for, the text you want to search for. Then we give it the file or files that we want to search in. So I can say star.java like this, and then it will give us the results. So here's the results of this search. In the color.java, it has inside of a comment, it says these colors can be passed into the terminal classes set foreground method. And so the grep output starts by telling you what file it found the text in. Then it has a colon, and then it tells you the text that it found, this particular line of the file. In entity.java, we call set foreground. In inventory.java, we call set foreground. Then there's a comment referencing it in terminal.java, and then we have the actual method declaration here in terminal.java. So you can see that the method is actually declared here in this file. It's called in two other files, and then a couple of comments are referring to it as well. The word grep sounds kind of weird. Um, what it stands for, I believe, is global regular expression print. So it is, I guess, global referring to the fact that it can search through a whole bunch of different files at once. Regular expressions will, I think, talk about in some sort of bonus content for this class. They are sort of a way of specifying patterns that you can search for. Here we searched for just the word set foreground, but grep is actually uh, sort of a lot more complicated than we'll talk about just today. It can search for more complicated patterns as well. And then P for print is uh, to print out the results, which is what it does here. So kind of this weird word grep uh, is an acronym, essentially. Programmers and people who use command line systems will use grep as a verb, just like you and your friends talking might say, hey, just Google this. Uh, if you're talking about you have a bunch of files, you can say, oh, I'm going to grep for this method, or I'm going to grep for this variable to see if it exists. Uh, so you can use grep as a verb, too, if you want to. So grep has some other things that it can do. One of the things we can pass is dash i. And with dash i, it will ignore the case. So by default, grep is case sensitive. So if I type it like this, set foreground, it's not going to find anything because it 
doesn't exist in these files with a lowercase f here, grep by default is case sensitive. But if we pass the dash i option, then it will search for it, ignoring the case completely. And it looks like that we have all the same, uh, the same references to it. So if you can't remember if like something was capitalized or not, you can just slap the dash i flag on there, which will make it printed out sort of either way. Another useful flag is the dash n flag. So remember, we can either put it separately like that or just together like this. And what that does is it causes grep to put in the line numbers as well. So now it tells us that in line three of color.java, this comment appears. You can see that it's declared on line 70 of terminal.java and used on line 71 and 60 of inventory and entity.java, respectively. So that sort of tells it to put in the, uh, the, file, the line numbers for where these references are found. All right, so the next one we'll talk about isn't going to be ter terribly useful in this instance is the dash V flag. So if we do dash V on here, it's going to print out basically every line of code in the entire project, which is uh, on its surface, not very useful. But what dash V does is it inverts the search. So now it's going to search for any text that doesn't have the word set foreground in it. So if I want to, I can maybe put semicolon in here. And now it'll print all lines from this project that don't have a semicolon in them. And so you can see that we get all of this code here, but there aren't any lines with semicolons. The uh, dash V flag isn't going to be very useful until next week when we talk about using pipes. Uh, so I'll just throw this on here for now, but we'll come back to this next week when we talk about pipes. Dash V stands for invert the uh, invert the search. So search for things that don't contain this text or don't contain this pattern. Okay, the next grep flag that we can talk about is searching recursively, which doesn't make as much sense to do in this particular example because I'm just in this directory and this directory just contains a bunch of .java files. But if I go up one directory, then I can search for everything that contains, let's say, the set foreground again with the dash R flag. So if I do grep dash R, set foreground, and now I can just say search here in this directory. And what that will do is it will cause it to search in all of the directories and subdirectories that I have within wherever I'm doing this search. So if I tell it to search recursively in dot, then it'll go into each of these subdirectories to find what we're looking for. So this is really helpful if you have something somewhere in your home directory, but you don't know where you put it. So I can search for, let's say, um, my bash uh, profile command that we talked about a couple of weeks ago for searching for alias, because I know that somewhere I have a file that has alias in it, and I can grep for that. And then we can see that I have uh, in my bash profile uh, all of these words that say alias. Uh, these um, also include some other things like vim info because I was editing my bash profile and the bash rc file we talked about has some sort of things like built into it and then there's some other stuff too but uh, this dash r searches just everywhere sort of recursively so as another example I can search for another example program that I've used for some of our examples in these videos is that Python file that just sort of asks what's your name and then it prints out a little message to you. I can recursively search for that if I don't know or remember where I put it. And to do that, I can say like, what is your name like this? And in this case, if your pattern, the thing that you're searching for, contain spaces, you have to put them inside of quotation marks. We'll talk more about quotation marks when we get to shell scripting in this class. But for now, if you have something that you want to search for, and it's just a single word, you don't need the quotation marks. But if it has spaces in it like this, you would need the quotation marks. And so if I forgot my dash r option, if I search recursively for this, it should find that, hey, in the place we are now, our home directory, then in the bin directory, there's this program.py file that does contain this, this, this word here. And so then I could open that up because now I know where it is. So that's grep and how you use it to search for the contents of files. Next, we'll search for files by other things. So grep is, remember again, for things like the actual text that's inside the file. There's this other command called find, and find doesn't search for files by the things that are inside of them, but rather 
for like the properties that describe them, such as their name, uh, their permissions, uh, when they've been accessed, their sizes, uh, stuff like that. So if I knew that the program was called uh, program.py, but I don't know where it is, then I can use find instead for that. And the way that find works is we give the command find, which is a lot more um, easy to understand why it's called find than grep. Uh, then we give it the place to start searching. So here I can either do tilde for my home directory, or I can do dot because that's the directory I'm currently in. Then we give it any number of sort of search arguments. And so one that we can give it is dash name, and then I can say program.py. And now it should start searching in the current directory for any files named program.py, and then it'll find it in the bin directory. We can do this uh, without specifying sort of like an exact thing like this by putting in a pattern like star.java. And so now this should search for all of the Java files anywhere inside of these directories. And it looks like I have a few. I have in this roguelike one all of these Java files here. And then in this project one directory, I have some other Java files. I just put some sort of like simple uh, Java programs in here so that we can play around with this stuff. So this will find any file that ends in .java using our friend the asterisk wildcard. So any text followed by star.java. If we want to find any files that begin with the word, uh, or rather the letter i, then we can do it like this. We can see that there's some inside of this roguelike command. Any that start with b, we can see there's a few uh, across here like this. So find with dash name can either be given an exact name like this, and then it will find exactly the thing you're looking for, or it can be given any sort of pattern like this. Um, so that is one of the things that we can search by, is by the name. That's also probably the most common. But there's other things that we can search as well. We can search for empty files, and it looks like I have some. Um, some of them, actually all of them, uh, are just sort of hidden things, uh, things in the git uh, directory of my, one of my Vim plugins, uh, a couple things uh, as, as well. Um, I don't have any sort of useful empty files, but if I did, then this would find them. It should find a.txt now. So if you want to find files that are empty, that's another one of these things we can do. We can also pass it executable to find executable files and directories. Uh, let me, hmm, where did I go? Let me go into the bin directory to do this, and I'll search in here because these are both direct, uh, both executables. And so now it'll find these two things because they're executable files. If I touch another file to create it, this one isn't executable, and so it won't find that. Let me make a directory in here so I can show you something else. Uh, let's call it stuff, and then cd into stuff, and then I'll make. Uh, a shell script and then make it executable using some of the things we've done in past weeks. And just for fun, just another directory here. So, uh, or rather, another file here. So now inside of this stuff directory, I have one file which I did make executable and one which I did not. And here I have two files that are executable and one which is not. Now, if I find from here all of the executable files, we'll see that it finds b.sh, which is good, the copy to all and program.py programs, because those are both marked as executables. It didn't find a.txt or c.txt, which makes sense because they're not executable. But it also found the stuff directory. And remember, when we talked about permissions, when we talked about the executable permission, we said that a file is executable if you can run the file like as a program. But a directory is executable if you're allowed to go into the directory. And because we are allowed to go into the stuff directory, it has the execute permission. If I do, uh, this is my alias for ls-l to list all the stuff. You'll find that, uh, oops, where am I? I just uh, need to do it here. The stuff directory is executable. And so therefore, it shows up in the list of executable things with find as well. If you want that not to happen, then you can also throw on another of these uh, sort of search parameters for find, which is the dash type. 
dash type can be used for searching for specific types of things like specifically files or specifically directories or specifically symbolic links and you can combine multiple of these multiple of these together so this should find us everything that is ex executable that's a regular file and now it won't list stuff it will only list the things that are actually files Likewise, if we were here in the bin directory and I want to find all of the things that were just directories, I could do dash type D and that would find just stuff like this. Likewise, if we want to search for links, we could do dash type L. There are no links here. I wonder if I have any links anywhere. I do, I have one symbolic link, which is a symbolic link to a color scheme I made for Vim. Um, so that's, that's the only link I have. Of course, if we search in my home directory for dash type F, we'll get tons and tons of things, all of the files I have, or dash type D, we'll get tons and tons of things. Most of these are in the hidden stuff, so you don't really need to worry about them like that. Next week, we'll talk about how to filter out the hidden things when we talk about uh, using pipes, which again is going to be super exciting to get to. Something else you can do with find is search for things that have been modified within a certain amount of time. So we can do that using find from the starting place of our current directory. Things that were modified oops, um, within the past 60 minutes. So M min stands for, I think, minimum minutes. So at least in the past 60 minutes. And then here we give a dash before to the number. And so if we do this, it should give us all of the things that were modified in the past hour, which is kind of helpful if you know you were working on something, but you're not sure where it was, you can sort of use this to narrow down what it was. So here's some of these things that I made just in the past, uh, in the past little bit when we were talking about uh, this. The bash history file, this saves all of the commands that you do one by one. Uh, that's so that you can use this history command to get a list of all of your file, or rather all of the commands that you've done. And so this would pretty much always be in the list of most recently files because every time you do any command, it gets put into bash history. Vim info is where Vim stores stuff like when you open a file, it'll bring you to the same line you were on last time. Vim info is where that sort of information gets put by Vim. So if you're using Vim and Bash, these will pretty much always be in your most recent modified files that you can find with find like this. But the other ones will be sort of the things that you've been working on. And you can sort of narrow down the minutes and sort of see what, uh, what things you've, you've been working on like that. There's also a way that we can search for files of a given size, which is by doing find and then the starting place again, and then the dash size search criteria. And here we can search for things of a given size, like um, 100K should search for things that were 100 kilobytes or larger. I only have a few, which is like in my Vim, uh, Vim stuff that I have. Let me search for things that are uh, let's say 5k or bigger. That will find some more things. Uh, it will also uh, include some actual Java code. So we could, if we want to find like the biggest Java files that we have, we can do it like this. Java. Give me the files that are at least 5k that are named anything ending with JAVA. And so find will find all of those things. One thing I should maybe point out is that grep and other commands like ls by default aren't recursive, but find by default is recursive. It always starts at this starting point that you give it, but it will always go into subdirectories, which is why I was able to find these things in the roguelike directory here. We can change this to be any sort of number of things. So this is files that are at least one kilobyte. I don't have any that are 10 kilobytes. I can sort of use this, I guess, to find the biggest file that I have that is a .java file, which apparently is this terminal.java file. So again, we can combine as many of these things as we want together. So I can say start here in my home directory and find me any files that are executable. That'll find a whole bunch. Give me only regular files. That'll still find a good amount. And then give me all of the ones that are named something.py, star.py and that will search for all of the files that are executable. They're just regular files, and their name ends in .py. 
We can also say the ones that have been modified in the past 60 minutes. There aren't any in this case. Uh, under how long ago it was that I modified this file. Um, so you can combine these things together as much as you want. There's one other thing that we can do with the find command that is really cool, which is that we can say to find, once you've found all the files that match my search criteria, I want you to do something specific with them. So again, this one finds these three Python files. We can give it the dash exec option. And what that does is it allows us to put in a command that we are going to then do on all of the files that are passed in. <clears throat> so for now, I'll just put ls. And then you put this opening curly brace, closing curly brace. That should be replaced with the name of the file. So again, our goal in this is to say, OK, find, you're going to find all the files that match whatever search criteria I put in here. Then I want you to do something to them. In this case, we're going to say list them. So ls followed by the name of the file. And then we have to end it with a escaped semicolon like this. So this part here is the command that we're going to do on each individual file that is found, with the curly brace thing being substituted for the name of the actual file. So this will do ls on this, ls on this, and ls on this. And so if I run this, we'll just get, uh, it looks exactly the same because ls just prints it like that. I guess I can print ls-l. And now it's quite long, but you see that it did the ls-l long listing on each of these files. So I can then take in that information and see when they were modified, um, uh, who's the owner, what are the permissions, and stuff like that. Let me do this again. Another thing we can do is to maybe do the wc command. WC gives us how many words and characters and lines are in the file. OK, I had to look it up. <laughs> um, the first column is the number of lines, then it's the number of words, and then follow. Uh, finally, it's the number of characters. So this program.py has nine lines, 17 words, and 114 characters in it. So that's what the WC command does. Usually, I use it with the dash L flag to just tell me how many lines are in the file. So 31 lines here, 13 lines here, 9 lines here. So the exec can be used to say, OK, find me all these files, and then like do something to them. Um, if I wanted to make them unexecutable, I could do something like this. Uh, write, um, let's say, you go minus x. This will take the execute permissions off of all of these files. If I were to run it, uh, I won't do that, but um, we can. By the way, if you're ever in a command and you want to just like get out of it and not run it, you can do Control C. Just like that can be used to cancel a running program, like we talked about last week. It can be used to sort of like bail out of writing a command and you know start a fresh one. So. That is the find command, which again, grep is used for searching files by their contents, like the stuff that's actually written into them. And find is used for searching files by name, or by type, or by permissions, or whether it's empty, and sort of that, when it's been modified at size, sort of like the metadata about the file itself. All right, the next thing we can talk about is comparing files. And to do that, I can go into this bin directory where I have, I made a copy of program.py called program2.py. And for this, we can start looking about comparing these files because they're very similar, except they do have some differences. The most basic way of seeing the differences between two files is the diff command. So we can do program.py and program2.py. And it gives us this input, or rather this output. It tells us sort of what lines and characters have been changed, like where we're starting here. Then it gives us what's in one of the files, and here it gives us what's in the other file. So the one has a simple program, name equals input, what is your name, hello name, and then two blank lines. This one is missing the comment and is also missing the two blank lines, and these, name, these lines are slightly different. Instead of what is your name, this one says what's your name, and instead of hello, this one says hi. So that's one way we can do this is with the diff command. If two files are exactly equal, like I'll copy to all to cp to all maybe, uh, diff gives you no output at all. So if diff responds back with nothing whatsoever, 
then uh, it, there was no differences. The files are exactly identical. So there are a few things that we can tell diff to ignore. So if I put some, just some blank lines in one of these and then do the diff again, then it will tell me that there's differences, that there's li uh, lines of difference here. I think it's dash B. Yeah, dash B tells it to ignore blank lines. Likewise, if I have just some extra white space in one, so um, I don't know if the indentation is different. Like, let's say I have eight spaces to indent here. By default, diff will say that those are different. It will, it will tell me the differences there. If I also do, well, I guess this one, because we're ignoring the blank lines, uh, if we also do dash w, it will ignore white space as well. So if you sort of care about that, like not ignoring white space and not counting blank lines, you can use those flags to sort of tell diff to ignore those things. For the most part, all that I use diff for is for checking if two files are exactly equal or not. If I have like multiple copies of a file by accident or something like that, I can say, hey, are these actually identical uh, with diff? If you actually want to see the differences in more of like a fine-grained way, then there's other commands that are, I think, more helpful, one of which is sdiff. So if I do sdiff on program.py and program2.py, uh, the terminal is a little bit uh, too narrow for this. OK, there we go. I'm just going to do that temporarily so that we can see sort of the full thing. So now let me clear this and run it again. OK, so this sdiff stands for side-by-side -side diff. Side-by-side -side diff gives us um, essentially the same thing, except it will print one file, program.py, on the left, and then the other program.py program .2, uh, program on the right. And so you can sort of trace by line by line and see what is different. It didn't do the best job because it didn't recognize that this input line is actually the same as this input line here. But you can see that it sort of um, puts them line by line. And then this one has these greater than signs, which means that there are lines in this file over here that just don't exist at all on the file on the right here. So that's sdiff, which stands for side by side diff. There's an even more useful one called vimdiff, which we saw briefly. It made a cameo appearance when we talked about git, I believe. Now if we open up vimdiff like this, it, just like sdiff, will show the files sort of side by side like this. Um, you can switch back and forth between them by doing control w w. So control w followed by w brings you from one to the next. And then you can sort of edit these files and sort of change them uh, as you go. So one thing I'm going to do is I'll put a comment over in here. Um, simple. Without the comment, it wasn't quite as smart as it would be without it. So now that we do that, vimdiff, as you can see, highlights the things that are different between them. So it highlights that this says, what is your name, whereas this one says, what's your name? And then it highlights in red the hi versus hello. So it singles out the differences between them. Then if you look, we have the um, fact that there's no lines here between 5 and 6 sort of highlighted like this, whereas in this file we can see that uh, we have extra lines sort of at the end. If I take those off, then it will look even more similar with just the things that are actually different separating them. One other thing that we can do with vimdiff is actually go between the changes and merge them to sort of make the files equal. So if I do bracket C like that, it will jump to the next line that has differences with the other file. Then I can either do DP to put the change from the left side into the right side, or DO to take the change on the other side and put it over here. So if I do DP, it should change the other one. Oops. Um, uh, <laughs> it changed the other one to uh, have the text that we have. And then confusingly, it just looks like this, which just sort of indicates that the files are now the same. If I quit out of here out of here. Now uh, the two files should be identical, which that uh, didn't um, look, it didn't really show you what was happening because when you open up two files that are identical with Vim, vimdiff, uh, it shows them like this. They're, they're exactly the same. So let me uh, set up another sort of um, example of this. I'm going to go into the larger program we have 
the roguelike and let me copy one of the bigger files like let me say um, um, let me copy enemy.java as enemy2.java okay then we're going to make a couple of changes to this one so we can really show off vim def a little bit more so let's say that in this one we have um, five options and then case four is it's just not going to move whatsoever. Oops, I'm not typing well. <laughs> I see. Um, so that's two changes into the file down there. And then let's say that here, instead of red, we say it's blue. Um, and then let's set this variable to true. And uh, yeah, like that. And let's put an extra comment. Start the class, something like that. It should do a little bit of a better job showing this off with a larger file. So I'll open up enemy.java and then enemy2.java in the other tab. So now you can see that as we scroll between this, it shows the differences between them. We have the missing comment over here in the left file. We have these things being different over here. We have the change of the number here, and then we have two missing lines down here. So now I can show you bracket C, which allows us to jump between the things that are different. So bracket C goes forward, and then uh, rather closing bracket C goes forward, and then opening bracket C goes backwards between them. And so now we can, oops, what did I do? Uh, do the changes sort of one by one. So if I do DP, again, it should change the right one so that it says red instead of blue. And that change then is made like that. I, of course, can go over to the other one and then hit undo to undo that change. Hop back over here. In this one, I can do DP, or rather, sorry, DO, which will be the other change gets pulled into here. So DO will make, uh, make this one be true. So the way I think of it is, DP is like the P stands for push, difference push. We're going to push our version into the other file, whereas DO stands for difference other. Take the other one's change and pull it into here. So again, if I do DP, that will make that one match the one I'm on. And here, if I do DO, it will pull it from there. Then Vimdiff hides lines that are like done with um, that, that don't have any differences to make it easier. So it jumps right from line 11 to line 44. We can uh, open this up with ZO. So this is Vim's uh, folding uh, system where it sort of like hides code that uh, you don't need to see. So if you want to see what's in one of these, you could do ZO to open the fold. And then if you want to close it again, you can do ZC. So Vim, again, has lots and lots of stuff. Um, then if we want to sort of at the beginning sort of go to the next difference, we can do it with um, bracket C like this. And then again, we can either do DO or DP. So let me do DP to pull that one. That'll close that fold off. And then if we jump uh, rather here, I can do uh, DP to pull this as well. That's going to close this up. If we open it again, we'll see that these uh, files are now pretty much the same, except for this little difference here, um, which I can jump to. And then maybe I'll take the comment uh, away by doing DP. That should get rid of it. And now these files uh, should be identical. So you can use vimdiff to sort of look at two different files, either just to see the differences, like this, um, highlighted in red, or if you want to actually sort of like go through and decide which one should be which, then uh, you can use vimdiff for that. This is going to be really, really helpful in Git, especially because, like we said, you can use um, Git to uh, sort of uh, manage the differences between two, two things. We'll see that more when we get to the second week on Git later on in the semester. By the way, uh, if, to, if you have multiple files like this, you can do Q all to quit all. Um, otherwise, you have to quit sort of one by one. And also, Vim can be used to open up multiple files like this anyway. If you do vSplit, uh, if you have one file open, uh, split and then you give another file name, it'll open them up side by side like this. So you can sort of go back and forth between two files in split screen kind of mode like this. 
Uh, it works better if you have your window a lot bigger. Um, I have mine sort of small so that the writing shows up well in the video. And then you can do Q all to quit out of them. All right, so I adjusted the window size again if you saw it change. Uh, the next thing we'll talk about is replacing in files. So this can be done in a single file by using the colon percent %s. So if we want to, say, in this file, change the variable that we have here called a room to something else like maybe area, if you realize that maybe it's not always a room, maybe it's like an outdoor area. And then we saw how we can do this. Um, colon percent %s slash whatever it was before, slash whatever you want it to be, slash optionally gc. And then we can sort of go through and confirm these changes as we go. Or you could hit A to sort of make them all be changed at once. That's one thing we can do to change the sort of do a search and replace in the command line. But the downside of this, or I guess the limitation of it, is that it only does one file at a time. We also can make this change across all of the different files that exist here. So this word room appears not just in the room.java or wherever we were, where we, we were in game.java, but it appears in other ones as well. So if you wanted to change this uh, variable name across your entire project, wherever it is used, you could either open up all of the files in them one by one to do the colon percent %s, or you could do it with this other command called sed. Sed stands for stream editor, and it lets you sort of do the vim search and replace thing, but on the command line instead. So if we wanted to do it, this substitution in the game.java, it would look like this. Room area in game.java. And so if we do this, it will go ahead and do it, and it will print out the results onto the command line. So if you look at it, when we did the sed command, it gave us the text as it's been searched and replaced. That's why it is called stream editor, because it sort of like takes in its input and then it prints out its output again. Uh, but sed can be made to do it inside of the file itself as well. So it didn't actually change room.java, excuse me, game.java. If we open it up, it still says room here. So if you want sed, to actually make the change to the file directly, you can give it the dash i flag for in place, and then it will go ahead and do that. Now if I open up game.java, it has been changed. I should warn you that you shouldn't really use sed on your files unless you have them safe in git, because if you do your search and replace wrong, you can like royally screw things up. But because this isn't git, I feel confident doing it, and so it did the change here. It changed all of the places that say room to places that now say area instead. But what if I wanted to do that to all the files in one fell swoop like I talked about? Well, we can combine it up with our friend the find, file, uh, find command. And I can say find all of the files called star.java, then do a command on them. And that command is to said in place substitute room with area on the file, and then end it. And so then, oh, um, I can put these in quotes here. There we go. Uh, it got confused by having the star here, so that needed to be in quotes as well. So now, were I to open up any of these files, in all of them, we have changed the word room to area, including in the comments. So that has uh, changed it across the entire project all at once. And again, you don't necessarily want to use this if you don't have your files backed up in Git because there's no way to undo it. Again, that's why Git is like super, super helpful. Another example, just to see it real quick, let's say um, that's another uh, thing I can change. Um, let's say I decide in the color to change the word magenta to purple. Oops. I want everywhere that it says magenta, I want it to say purple instead. I can do that by, again, saying find here all of the files that end in star.java. 
forgot the quotes last time, but I won't forget them this time. Then do a command on them, which is to do a sed in place to search and replace or substitute the word magenta for the word purple instead. Like that. So it is a little bit tricky to remember the different parts of this. So with the exec, with um, uh, the command that you give it, you give it the command, and then the curly braces here are like the file name. So we want to, that's, that's where the file name would go in the sed command that we're doing. So we're sort of building it up in pieces. And then the slash semicolon just ends the exec part of it. And so now if we do that, now if we look in color.java, it should have changed magenta to purple, which it did. And we can see where else the word purple is used. I'm not sure if that color is used anywhere else, but it is in a few places if you look um, in, in these, different, in these different, uh, different files. So we did the search and replace all at once across all of the files at once. So uh, that is all for today. We talked about doing searches in files by their contents, like how do you find the file that has something written in it. Then we also talked about how to find files based off of their file name or when they were modified or their size or what type of thing they are. Then we talked about comparing files. You have the diff command, which is like the bare bones one. It just prints the differences out, which is not easily readable in my view. Then we talked about sdiff, which shows them side by side. That's sort of nice for quickly looking at the differences and uh, sort of seeing what lines are different. And then the most powerful one is vimdiff, which lets you jump between the differences dynamically, interactively, and if you want to merge them back and forth. And then finally, we talked about doing search and replace in files, sort of a continuation about what we talked about last time, uh, or rather when we talked about vim, except now we can do it with the help of the find command and also the sed command to do a search and replace across all of our files sort of at once. Next week, we're going to be talking about um, one of the coolest, most powerful parts about doing the command line, which is file redirection and especially pipes. Pipes are going to be super helpful. We're going to be able to do so many more things uh, with the help of pipes, like um, uh, search the, use the grep command that we just learned to search the output of other programs. They basically let you sort of like glue different pieces of programs together to do more complicated and interesting things. So thank you all for watching. I'll see you next time. Bye.